like to introduce our keynote for this afternoon, uh, Dr. David Wheeler. Um, David is uh, President and Vice Chancellor of Cape Breton University. Uh, he's an experienced academic and business person. Uh, started his career as uh, in the management team of the Body Shop International and uh, was a um, director and professor at the Hobb Program in Sustainability at Schulich. And that's certainly where I met David at New York a number of years ago. Uh, he then went on to become Dean of Management at Dalhousie University. Uh, he was um, the Executive Dean of Business at the University of Plymouth. And of course, now Cape Breton. And David's talk today is on disruption and disturbance, a new paradigm for sustainability education. So join me in welcoming David. Well, thank you, Pam, for that uh, very warm introduction. It's uh, great for me to be able to bring greetings from the small island state of Cape Breton. <laughs> you know, we take our independence uh, and our feistiness very seriously. And where we're embarked on some uh, quite interesting experiments uh, around sustainability and education, uh, which I want to touch on uh, a little this afternoon, uh, but before I do that, I, I just wanted to say how wonderful it is for me to be back in Toronto and to uh, see so many friends and uh, former colleagues who are continuing, uh, like LSF, to drive this agenda forwards with steadfastness and creativity and uh, passion. Um, and I particularly want to uh, acknowledge David Bell, who has long been a mentor to me, a supporter through my various situations, York and beyond, uh, and who recently has been involved in helping us put together a new master's program, uh, which I think will be very important uh, as a future teacher education, I'll say a little bit about that today. Uh, but David, you continue to be an inspiration, and the members can retire while David is still doing the study. So um, as long as David keeps going, we'll all keep going. Uh, I also wanted to give uh, what we now call a shout out uh, to Brian Kelly, who sat there. Brian uh, used to make, make me look very good in the HAP program uh, at Schuick, uh, because of course he ran the Sustainable Enterprise Academy uh, and has done more than anyone else in this country to take corporate Canada uh, a few inches along the road to more sustainable uh, activities. And so great to see Brian again and, and to, to learn that uh, he's still causing trouble. He's now, uh, apart from his day job, um, which is, is, is very sensible, um, he's also suing the fossil fuel industry uh, for the externalizing their impacts over the last 100 years. So round of applause for Brian. For... <laughs> Disruption and disturbance are <laughs> something that uh, some of us are always being involved with, and uh, certainly both David and Brian, many of the colleagues, um, have been fellow travellers with me, so I'm still trying to do that. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about um, ultimately how we build uh, a more integrated educational ecosystem for a sustainable future, uh, and why I wanted to get to that point and, and get to it with some principles and some drivers is that uh, we are going to be embarked on a big experiment in Cape Breton Island in the next few years. And we are very, very keen to get feedback on that experiment and, and to learn from you and all the amazing things you're doing you know, in Ontario and elsewhere because people come from across the country to be part of this uh, event. So I'm, I'm coming here with some ideas but also a plea for feedback and engagement and, and support as we try to do something quite uh, exciting and interesting in Cape Breton. So I wanted to, to, to share some principles that, that are guiding the work we're doing in Cape Breton and then talk about some of the drivers and opportunities coming from those drivers in terms of system-wide change, which I, I find very exciting. So uh, starting with some principles, and um, 
you know, for me, having done a lot of work in corporate sustainability over the years, working with uh, Brian, of course, and many others, uh, I wouldn't say I've given up on <laughs> corporate sustainability. It's still important. It needs to happen. So the work that you know Bob Willard is doing, many other colleagues are doing around getting corporations more engaged. You know, you've got corporate leaders like 3M and others. It's fantastic. But where I'm now much more interested is, is in the disruptive. Uh, and uh, this, this notion of creative disruption, which we uh, owe to Joseph Schumpeter, is an important concept. And it's certainly one that we used to use at the Sustainable Enterprise Academy, where really we're talking about entrepreneurial approaches to uh, ushering in the new economy, the green economy, rather than just thinking about the large corporations who have to change. Important though that is. So a lot of my interests now are the intersection of, of, of sustainability education and entrepreneurial education. And, and for those of us that have long been in the sustainable development movement, that's a bit of a leap because we're not used to celebrating business leaders. We, we're used to seeing them as part of the problem. Uh, but of course, it's the younger and newer disruptive business leaders operating in food and agriculture, uh, IT energy that really are, I think, going to be the role models for future generations who, who bring together their passion for sustainability and sustainable development with different ways of organizing the economy through entrepreneurial approaches. So this is an important piece of the puzzle, I think, is to understand you know, how economics works, how capitalism works, and, and how we can reinvent capitalism from within uh, if we play to the strengths and creativity of some of our more interesting business leaders. Um, and then this one also is an important principle. Um, I guess we've all been on many barricades over the years, and it, it, it's so tempting for those of us that bring passion to our work on sustainability and sustainable development to get into this thou shalt mode. Uh, and this is often, of course, where uh, you know, environmentalists, social activists, and academics uh, can be accused of saying, well, I know the solution, and, and therefore everyone else should understand that and behave the way um, that we think everyone should behave. And that is such a temptation, but it's a temptation that has to be resisted at all costs. Right? Because uh, as someone who used to report to me at Body Shop uh, once said, and it always struck me as being incredibly important advice, is that you never change someone by making them wrong. So if your stance is, we're going to tell you you're the problem, and then we're going to fix you, guess what, nothing happens. And uh, of course, Cicero noted that uh, <coughs> uh, uh, a long time ago. And then finally, an uh, important principle for, for our work, and certainly has uh, been <coughs> over the years, is this notion of centrality of dialogue. Uh, because we have to share perspectives, share knowledge, share ideas in the spirit of openness and learning. And uh, again, that's what creates the conditions, I think, for entrepreneurial solutions. Because if you don't dialogue, if you don't look for opportunities and A plus B plus C makes something amazing, uh, then again you'll miss a lot of chances, a lot of uh, forces for change. So again, um, it, it's hard work doing dialogue, hard work sitting down with people who you're used to seeing as part of the problem. Uh, certainly business often fits into that category. I think there's many people uh, rightly criticising the history of business, but somehow you know, we've got to flip into this mode where we learn from the best of business, we learn from the best entrepreneurs who are changing things for the better. And, and dialogue, therefore, is central to that. Um, reasons to be cheerful. Uh, I think the work that LSF is doing so amazingly well in terms of creating this informed youth citizenry, and there's various people being representing uh, last night and today the um, importance of that part of the, the transformation we all uh, wish to see. Those engaged youth citizens will become very empowered uh, citizens, voters in years to come. And I think what we're now seeing is a level of demand being exerted from within uh, society for different goods and services and, and different forms of economic activity that is incredibly exciting. Uh, because sometimes that manifests itself as opposition to the existing order, nothing wrong with that. But increasingly, I'm seeing it flow into why don't we do this and why don't we buy that rather than that. Uh, again, I think um, partly because of the growth of the internet and social media, 
you know, empowered citizens today are more powerful uh, than, than ever before in any, any stage of our history. So, you know, empowered citizens are demanding new systems of food production, distribution, and consumption. Uh, again, we've heard some good examples of that uh, uh, last uh, little while. And, and uh, you know, the, the, the anti movement for GMOs, I think, is very quickly you know, also becoming a pro movement for uh, healthy, wholesome food, locally produced and locally consumed. Uh, but of course, it doesn't help the dialogue when. when um, large corporations sue their consumers uh, or their citizens, but uh, one day they'll stop doing that. Uh, the energy industry, again, you know, it, it, it's subject to massive opposition on certain topics. I had the dubious privilege of running a major study on hydraulic fracturing uh, last uh, year for the province of Nova Scotia. Learned a lot. Uh, certainly learned about the passions of, of people who are opponents of hydraulic fracturing. As, as the studiously agnostic chair of the process, um, you know, I didn't take a personal stance. Um, but the opposition to um, fracking, uh, of course, is visceral everywhere. And I know that it's a topic of, of interest here in Ontario at the moment. Um, but again, you know, that very quickly uh, turns itself into uh, opportunities for new forms of energy production and distribution and consumption, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, because the same people who are protesting fracking are also the people who will be driving uh, the demand for new forms of energy, energy storage, uh, energy distribution, smart grids, and so on. And then, uh, again, I can't resist mentioning this one. Um, students uh, today are getting much more demanding of universities, and therefore university administrations are quite right too. Um, and they are demanding new forms of education, they're demanding free education, something I happen to support. Uh, these are incredibly positive signs, I think, for we don't like the current situation, we don't want to see tuition continuing to rise negatively forever until we're like the United States, we want a different model. Uh, again, that's a global movement uh, for free tuition, uh, certainly in the UK, where I recently spent three and a half years, but uh, the majority of G20 countries actually do have free tuition and uh, we could probably learn something from those. So system-wide change is coming uh, and within system-wide change, with empowered citizens, educated young people, anything is possible. And I'm just going to take two examples. I, I could take hundreds of course, but we don't have that much time to do it now. So uh, let me talk about energy because that's uh, a topic I've spent quite a bit of time in the last few years. Um, and what's really neat with energy is that it will be those disruptive forces that completely blow apart the status quo. Um, so, you know, we know that uh, when you talk to utility managers, when they're polled uh, privately, they will admit it's all over. You know, the days of the vertically integrated lumbering power utility are numbered and uh, they will not be around in their current form in you know, 10 or 15 years. So, you know, that's a shame if you've got lots of investments in that industry. But of course, what's exciting uh, is that as solar becomes incredibly cheap, uh, as wind continues to play a stronger role, as storage comes along, um, we're seeing the levelized costs of renewables plus storage uh, more attractive uh, than some of those old uh, um, industries based on coal, uh, nuclear, and so on. So, you know, that is amazing. That, that very soon it's going to be cheaper to go off grid, to have your own storage, Tesla, whatever it may be in your home, and you know, the entire industry will disappear and a new industry will emerge. And it'll be those green entrepreneurs, uh, the Annette Vashorans of this world, I have to give Annette a plug, she's my chancellor, um, who's a leading player in storage, but has now just got a franchise for Tesla uh, for the home battery thing. Um, so, you know, you just look at this, this graph. Um, so if you're in the um, electricity industry uh, and you think you're going to be dealing with status quo in terms of demand for your product, think again. Uh, because, of course, when you take into account these trends with smart grid storage, you know, Tesla cars, Tesla batteries in the home, whatever it may be, um, you're looking at a perfect storm. You're looking at uh, a dramatic 
decrease in demand for your product, which is the electricity produced, produced from a coal or an oil or a nuclear station. So that's why it's all over for that particular form of energy industry, but why it's exciting because the space is there for young entrepreneurs uh, who are going to be involved in the disaggregated version of energy uh, supply and distribution uh, who are going to make money. Uh, higher education comes as this one, although I'll be very brief. It is the context for, for what I'm going to be speaking about to wrap up, which is that it's all over for higher education as well, as we know. Um, you know, we, we um, like to think we're invulnerable, we like to think you know, we've got a fantastic product, and we do at CBU, of course, um, but uh, again, we're all going to be disintermediated very soon, uh, because uh, young people want to access their learning, their education in different ways these days. People around the globe want to access their education in different ways. And they will not be paying 20, 30, 30 40 thousand dollars a year for a degree in the next 10 or 20 years. They simply won't. Um, so what we're seeing is, is what you might call um, you know, storms ahead, which I would uh, liken to more of a tsunami, where uh, a number of factors, uh, technological, social, demographic, you name it, a number of factors are conspiring to mean that universities have to completely reinvent uh, if they're going to stay around uh, for the rest of this century. Uh, of course, it's very easy to be um, uh, optimistic and, and maybe look back on history and, and note, uh, as Rebecca Hughes of the British Council did last year, that of the 33 institutions that survived our times from the 16th century, 29 are universities. That's interesting. Uh, but of course, uh, our universities today don't look anything like uh, the universities in the 16th century, thankfully. Uh, and I'm sure if they still exist as institutions, on some level, uh, then again, they will look very, very different uh, in the next few decades. So, again, what that means is that we have an opportunity to reinvent, come up with new models for higher education, for the, the sharing of knowledge creation and the, the, the wiki uh, approach, if you like, to knowledge creation and dissemination. Um, what that means, for universities, certainly my own, is you get real close to your community, uh, you embed as deeply as you possibly can in your community, where you can stay relevant to their lives, uh, and of course, you know, you've got to be completely savvy in terms of how uh, learning and education is, is delivered and how it will be delivered in the next 20, 30 years. So, so the days of us all expecting the students to show up, be in a classroom, uh, gratefully then part of their tuition, I think those days are numbered. But what emerges in between, uh, in my view, what emerges in between is a much more collaborative and cooperative approach to higher education and knowledge creation, research and development and commercialization and so on, that is also very exciting, or it's scary if you're in that system and you depend on it and you want your pension to come from it. So, um, getting to the punchline now, how do we build an integrated educational ecosystem for a sustainable future? And what role should universities play in that? Given these massive forces, given the, you know, the old models are broken or breaking, uh, what are we going to do and how are we going to stay entrepreneurial, stay light on our feet, create value in society, social, economic, and uh, environmental. So th there's a number of things that I think are out there, just as pointers, uh, and uh, these are randomly selected just because I happen to know a little bit about them. Um, they are by no means comprehensive or necessarily indicative, uh, but they're just you know, things that give me a sense of what is possible. Um, this whole notion of social enterprise, social innovation, show that you all know as a leading player and all of that, uh, and the idea that our campuses can become hotbeds of social innovation. Um, I was talking to um, uh, people over, over lunch about uh, this organization, Regenesis, Regenesis um, mm -hmm. which uh, is a perfect example of bringing entrepreneurial approaches to food and other activities on campuses, again, why shouldn't uh, campuses be uh, you know, entrepreneurial spaces for young people to do things around food, energy, and anything else they want to do, uh, things around. And that's really what the change maker campus concept is about. Um, that we, we are empowering all of our uh, higher education participants to be the change makers, to be the social innovators. And that's a, a movement that is slightly 
uh, truncated by the ability of the Shoka to manage their network. But I think you know, any university with any sense is going to be, if not a, a Shoka change maker campus, is going to be an entrepreneurial campus, a campus where social innovation and social enterprise flourishes. Um, one of my own interests is in entrepreneurship education in developing countries, obviously with the sustainability um, frame. And I did some work uh, a couple of years back with the British government on looking at entrepreneurship education in East Africa. Again, Africa, those of you that have been to Africa and have got uh, some that are involved with Africa will know that uh, these days many parts of Africa are incredibly entrepreneurial. Uh, young people are very impatient for different ways of doing things. Um, but they're not getting an entrepreneurial education, which is interesting. Uh, if you go to business school in Africa, like if you go to business school in Canada, uh, what you're taught is how to be a middle manager for Coca-Cola. Uh, nothing wrong with being a middle manager for Coca-Cola, of course, um, but if you want to change the way the world works, those are a different set of skills. Um, and so the research that we did for the British government uh, in three countries in East Africa demonstrated there's not only a massive opportunity uh, to bring sustainable enterprise and sustainable entrepreneurship uh, to various parts of East Africa. But there's, there's enormous demand for that, almost unlimited demand for that from the youth uh, who are no longer assuming that the best way to get on in Tanzania or Kenya or anywhere else is to get a government job and then do something right on the side, which has been the history. Uh, what's emerging now, of course, is very different and very exciting. So again, a source of hope. And then our own little contribution that I just mentioned earlier, um, which we hope to have uh, up and running very soon, which David Bell has been uh, enormously influential in, is this notion that um, we have to equip our teachers uh, throughout their careers uh, to not just know about sustainability and sustainable development and bring that into their classrooms, They've also got to know about how to bring in concepts of innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship, uh, which doesn't come naturally, I have to say, for most teachers, because they didn't go to teaching to become entrepreneurs or to, to, to lord the entrepreneurial role, role models in green energy or green food or anything else. Uh, but somehow, we've got to set light to that movement as well, um, so that, uh, again, we can make sense for our young people of you know, why it's important to be both sustainable and entrepreneurial. So this little master's program that we want to get up and running very soon uh, attempts to do that. So um, in conclusion, Pam, if I'm still on time, lately, um, I do believe uh, universities have an enormous role to play, uh, role modeling um, what it looks like to be sustainable and entrepreneurial, uh, role modeling what it looks like to reinvent, as uh, all institutions must reinvent, and reinvent radically I would say as, as, as part of the unfolding of higher education for the rest of the century. Um, and you know, universities have got to update their products. You know, what do we teach, how do we teach it, and, and then most importantly, how do we integrate what we do uh, with the broader educational ecosystem? Because I think um, we've for too long seen the stages of education as being complementary but separate. Uh, so what we're going to try and do now in Cape Breton is to place the university in an educational ecosystem with our school systems, including our Aboriginal school systems, which are very strong in Cape Breton, uh, and with our community college, to try and bring to life the opportunity driving elements of sustainability, uh, which are entrepreneurial, which are social enterprising are social innovating. Um, so uh, we are going to try and do all these things, although these statements have got question marks, actually we've kind of uh, answered our own questions, at least in Cape Breton Island, and we're going to try and do this thing. Um, I mean, CBU is already a deeply community-engaged university anyway, so we're just going to kick that up a level, but then engage with the other educational actors uh, on Cape Breton Island to try and do something special in this whole space bring to life the opportunities around sustainability and sustainability education, uh, as well as the knowledge, uh, the environmental literacy, the social justice literacy, literacy and so on. How do you take that literacy and turn it into economic, social and cultural opportunities? So anyway, watch this space. 
Um, we would love to have you all come visit as often as you like, bring your best ideas, we'll try and steal them and do something with them. Um, but uh, I do hope that we can stay uh, very deeply connected to LSF during this journey because we are going to be seriously pursuing this experiment with our uh, other educational partners in Cape Breton. So for now, thank you very much.